The internet's scary, really scary, actually. I mean, the internet gave us real life live streams of kidnapped people being tortured and big chungus. Anyways, let's talk about some unsolved, sketchy things that went down on the internet via this iceberg. Also, guys, I have a Discord you should join if you want to join my community. It's pretty cool. And I have an Instagram you should go follow 100%. Also, before the mysteries, only like 3% of my viewers are subscribed, I think. So you should subscribe, please. Pretty please. Subscribe or I'll release spiders into your home. <laughs> All right, let's get straight into this. Layer one. Everyone talks about this. Cicada 3301. Cicada 3301 is a name that resonates with many as one of the most intriguing unsolved internet mysteries. It first appeared in 2012, popping up as a series of complex puzzles and cryptic messages spread across the internet. The initial puzzle surfaced on January 4th, 2012, with a post on a 4chan board, a popular online forum. It was a simple image that posed a challenge, hinting at a quest for highly intelligent individuals. The text read, Hello, we we are looking for highly intelligent individuals. To find them, we have devised a test. There's a message hidden in this image. Find it and it will lead you on the road to finding us. We look forward to meeting the few that can make it all the way through. Good luck, 3301. The intriguing part was the nature of these puzzles. They weren't just typical riddles or logic problems. Instead, they delved into various fields of knowledge and skills, including cryptography, steganography, data security, and even physical challenges. And I don't even know what the hell like half of those are. Solvers found themselves to encrypting complex code, translating obscure literary references, and visiting coordinates in the real world, where they would find posted QR codes and further clues. The mystery deepened as participants progressed. The puzzles led them through layers of encryption and hidden messages embedded in music, images, and the deep web. References to literature, philosophy, and mathematics were common, with allusions to words like Agrippa, which means a book of the dead, by William Gibson, and concepts from cyberpunk literature and historical figures like the Victorian occultist Aleister Crowley. Or at least, I don't know, man. <laughs> One of the most fascinating aspects of Cicada 3301 was its global scale. Clues were not confined to the digital world, some required like actual real physical presence. For instance, QR codes were found in various locations around the globe, including the US, Australia, France, and Poland. The purpose behind Cicada 3301 remains unclear. Theories range from it being a recruitment tool for a spy agency, a secret society, or a think tank, to more esoteric and even extraterrestrial hypotheses. What adds to the mystery is the organization's self-description is a group of individuals who believe in privacy, freedom of information, and cryptography. There have been three major iterations of the puzzle, in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Each round seemed to end with a select group of solvers being recruited for an unknown purpose, after which Cicada 3301 would go quiet. Despite numerous attempts to uncover the truth behind Cicada 3301, its origins and intent remain a well-guarded secret. Its allure not only lies in its complexity, but also in the philosophical and ideological underpinnings suggested by the clues and messages. This has led to like a cult following with communities still actively discussing and dissecting every aspect of the mystery, hoping to find answers or perhaps another puzzle to emerge from the shadows. Blank Room Soups on AVI. So this thing first popped up on YouTube in 2005 and it's pretty much what you'd expect from the title. A dude, face censored and all, is sitting there slurping down some chunky soup in a stark room, bawling his eyes out. But then these two freaks with blank faces and oversized heads start patting his back while he's getting his soup on. This is like me and the boys at Olive Garden when I ordered the most disgusting soup known to man like trying to impress the waiters or something but I don't want to be rude and like weird and not eat the soup. Now the internet being the internet went full on detective mode on this. Rumors started flying. People were saying it was some kind of dark web snuff film with the soup eating guy being forced to eat his wife's remains. Gross and creepy, sure, but it turns out it's a load of bull. The real deal seems to be less dark web horror show and more stolen costume prank. These mascot suits known as Ray Rays are linked to a guy named Raymond Percy who's a pretty big deal animator and has worked on stuff like Zootopia and The Simpsons. Percy's story is that these Ray Ray suits got swiped from his RV after a show and later he gets this weird soup video emailed to him and decides to share it on YouTube just for him and his friends to laugh at. But here's where it gets a bit sketchy. Some Reddit mods on the internet think that Percy's tale about the stolen costumes is a little bit too convenient. Like why would you upload this random creepy video to YouTube just to share with your buddies? And why does the soup eating guy kind of look like Percy himself? There's a theory floating 
floating around that this might have been some elaborate hoax or a weird publicity stunt for the Ray Ray characters. And get this, Percy had other videos on different platforms that kinda added fuel to the whole is a hoax fire. So what's the verdict? Is Blank Room Soup the AVI a creepy snuff film from the dark web? No, it doesn't seem like it. More likely, it's either a stolen costume prank or some bizarre art project slash hoax by Percy. Either way, it's one of those early YouTube mysteries that got everyone talking and theorizing, making it a pretty well-known internet mystery. Death of Elisa Lam Elisa Lam, a 21-year-old student from Vancouver, decided to hit the road for a solo trip down the west coast, landing herself at the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles. Now, this hotel isn't your typical holiday spot. It's got a rep for being a bit of a horror show, with a history of suicides, violence, and even a couple of serial killers like Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, hanging around. So yeah, not exactly the Ritz. Lamb, who was dealing with bipolar disorder, was in regular contact with her family during her travels, but suddenly the calls stopped. This set off alarm bells for her family who reported her missing. The search for Lamb led to a creepy elevator video showing her acting all kinds of strange, pushing buttons randomly, peeking out of the elevator, and generally seeming distressed. The footage sparked a wildfire of theories online. Some folks thought she was running from someone, others speculated about drug use, and a few even suggested the video was doctored. But none of the theories held up. Lamb wasn't on drugs, and there was no solid evidence of foul play in the video. Then things took a dark turn. Guests at the Cecil started complaining about the water. Low pressure, weird taste, you name it. When a maintenance worker checked the water tanks in the roof, he made a grim discovery. Lamb's body was in one of the tanks. The autopsy ruled her death an accidental drowning, with bipolar disorder as a significant factor. Her body showed no signs of a struggle, and she was found naked, with her clothes floating in the water along with her room key and watch. The big question everyone had was, how did she end up in the tank? The rooftop was supposed to be off-limits to guests, with alarms and all, but there's no evidence of any foul play or anyone else being involved. It suggested that her mental state at the time might have led her to the roof and into the tank, but the details of how and why it happened remain a mystery. And also, like, how would you even get in it and close it behind her? Like, it, it just makes zero sense at all. The Cecil Hotel and its staff faced a wrongful death suit from Lamb's family, but the court found the incident unforeseeable due to the area being off-limits to guests. Max Headroom Incident Okay, this is the Max Headroom Incident, a classic example of television hacking that makes you wonder if the 80s were just a collective fever dream. So picture this. You're chilling at home, watching TV, and suddenly, Max Headroom, the CGI character with a personality like a glitchy toaster, hijacks your screen. The mysterious figure sporting a Max Headroom mask and sunglasses, because nothing says cool hacker like 80s shades, takes over the airwaves. Not with some profound message or earth-shattering revelation, but with a performance that's part bizarre rambling and part physical comedy. And 100% I totally just drank expired milk. That part's unrelated, but um, I think I need to go to the hospital. He's swatting at flies, getting spanked with a fly swatter, because who doesn't think of fly swatter spanking when playing their big TV debut, and generally just throwing a chaotic, nonsensical party that nobody asked for. It's like if a meme from the future traveled back in time to confuse everyone before memes were even a thing. The best part is that despite all the effort, the FBI and FCC were like, yeah, we got nothing. It's like the ultimate unsolved mystery, like if Big Chungus Sherlock Holmes stumbled upon a case and just went, nope, too weird for me. To this day, everyone is still scratching their heads. Who was behind it? A bored genius? An avant-garde artist? A time traveler with a broken GPS? We may never know. If I go back in time and do that, I would go on and um and uh and put Skibbity Toilet on the on the in, in the TV in the 80s so that they could see it before us. Just to be a nice person because they deserve it. People from the 80s were cool, bro. They deserve Skibbity Toilet more than us, dude. We don't deserve that. All right, that was layer one, guys. Now, by the way, this iceberg, I'm taking these entries from an iceberg called just overall internet anomalies, right? And so very soon, I'm gonna come out with another video called Solved Internet Mysteries Iceberg Explained, Internet Urban Legends, Internet Hoaxes, Internet Lost media, etc. So a bunch of other internet videos are going to be coming out soon. So subscribe to see those. Or again, I mean, if you haven't subscribed yet, the spiders are already like probably made it to your bathroom. So be careful next time you're taking a poop. Or actually, if you're taking a poop while you're watching this video, leave a comment, please, because that's awesome. Anyways. All right, that was layer one. Let's get into layer two, which is the mostly known ones. Strange sounds in the sky. So the sky has been acting like it's auditioning for a spot in the Among Us crew, making bizarre noises all around the world. From the US to Australia, people have been reporting these eerie trumpet-like sounds. It's like the sky is trying to communicate, but all we're getting is sus vibes. Now before you start thinking that it's Ugandan knuckles out there clicking away, looking for the way, NASA's been like the voice- <laughs> 
Now before you start thinking this, Uganda and Knuckles up there clicking away, looking for Doei, Ness has been like the voice of reason. They explain that these sounds are actually natural, coming from something called acoustic gravity waves. Basically the Earth is dropping some serious bass lines with low frequency sounds modulated by even lower infrasonic waves. This celestial symphony is usually kicked off by massive energy events like solar flares. But with the internet being the internet, not everyone is convinced by NASA's explanation. There are theories floating around that range from the world's largest Yomama Joe gone wrong to harp meddling with the atmosphere. Some even suggest that the sounds are the disgruntled grumblings of space whales upset at our lack of progress in space exploration. But at the end of the day, it seems Mother Nature might just be showing off her skills in atmospheric acoustics, even if it sounds like she's been taking DJ lessons from Big Chungus. Owen High's final video. The last video she posted, man, that's where things get weird. It was about fashion and makeup tips, right? But then there's these two things that just don't add up. First thing is this buffering glitch that happens right at 48 seconds into the video, and it just keeps going for a minute, like a full minute with her audio still playing. And she's combing her hair and all, but it kind of looks like she's hitting her neck with the comb over and over, like, you know. Why didn't she fix this before uploading? Beats me, because she always edited her own stuff. Kind of makes you think, was it on purpose? And then there's the whole deal with the episode number. The video is called episode 48, but hold on, the one before it was episode 45. So what happened to 46 and 47, right? People are saying there's something up with the number 48, like it's all over the video. It starts glitching at 48 seconds, it lasts until 1.48, and then you look at the clock in the background and it's 8.30. Do the math, that's 48 again. And she passes away 48 hours after this video comes out, by the way. And it's the 48th episode, plus in episode 45 there's this moment at 4 minutes and 8 seconds and you see 48 on the screen. Too many 48s, man. Some people are even saying that the glitch was Morse code, like she was sending a message or something, saying I need to help 48 is here help me but that's not confirmed it's just people talking you know so it's like was she trying to tell us something like she knew something was gonna happen or that someone was after her she did have issues in the industry i mean it makes you wonder and also right before all this went down there's another thing that's got people talking oh and hi she posted something on instagram and then just like that it's gone deleted but you know how it is someone always takes screenshots it was this picture of a flower but it's got the caption that's got everyone scratching their heads it was all angry and stuff like she was calling someone out saying she's gonna expose them. Now, that's not something you see every day from her, right? It was like she was real mad at somebody. Maybe had a bone to pick or something. And then, all of a sudden, she's gone. Makes you wonder, was that post connected to everything else? Like, was it a piece of the whole messed up puzzle? It's just all bits and pieces, but put together, and it paints a pretty strange picture. But still, whatever the truth is, I hope she's at peace now. This one's just sad, man, you know? Chip Chan. Chip Chan, she's this Korean woman, right? And for over 10 years, she's been live streaming almost non-stop in different platforms. You tune into her stream and most times she's just hanging around her apartment. Sometimes she's browsing the internet, other times she's sleeping. And the thing that gets everyone's attention is that she has these signs up asking for help. But the big question is help from what? Here's where it gets wild. Chip claims she's being held captive in her own apartment by this guy she calls P. And she says P is a corrupt cop who's got cameras all over her place to keep tabs on her 24-7. Now nobody watching her streams has actually ever seen this P guy. And what's his deal? Like what are his motives? That's a mystery. And it gets crazier. Chip says she's got this microchip on her ankle. And according to her, the chip lets P hear her thoughts, control her movements, and it's the reason that she can't leave her apartment. She even believes this chip can put her to sleep. Now, you've got viewers who've tried to help, contacting the Korean authorities and all. But the cops say that they know about her, but they're calling her mentally ill, a problem for them. But Chip, she's not buying it. She says the police are in on it, that they're all corrupt, and that this is all part of one big conspiracy to keep her locked up. For a long time, she was streaming on YouTube under Control Weapon Mod. But then out of nowhere, on October 16th, 2021, she stopped streaming. This gets everyone thinking, did she disappear? Did something happen to her? Did P take her away? Her last stream's description is all about this pig, or P, breaking into her house and doing horrible stuff to her. She's talking about how Pig shut down the stream to cover up this mind control weapon. The whole situation is just messed up and scary, and it's sad too because it's clear this woman is dealing with some serious mental health issues. There's this post on Reddit that kind of sums it all up. It says, stop proposing to go save Chip. She's a paranoid schizophrenic. People have tried reaching out, but it only makes her more paranoid. And the mental health care in South Korea is not great. But it's believed that P is actually a healthcare worker helping her out. The landlord and local police are said to be in the loop too, trying to help her. It's a sad story, man, because in Korea, unless she seeks help herself, she's not gonna get it. But that one's sad, dude. 9-11 predictions in media. So there's this thing with movies, TV shows, and even songs that gets you thinking. They've got these uncanny predictions about 9-11 before it even happened. Take The Matrix, for example. Neo's passport in that movie expired 
expires on September 11th, 2001. Now that's a coincidence that's a bit too on the nose, don't you think? But then you've got The Simpsons, and everyone knows The Simpsons is like the Nostradamus of TV shows, always predicting stuff. There's this one episode where Lisa's holding a magazine, and it's got a reference that seems to hit at 9-11. It's subtle, but it's there. Moving on, Rugrats in Paris. This might sound out there, but hear me out. There's a scene in the movie where Chucky mentions 9-11, like 9-1-1, and then right then, a plane flies toward what looks like the Twin Towers. It's a bit eerie, considering what happened. Now the real kicker is Back to the Future. People don't usually think of it as prophetic, but there's a whole theory about it. You've got the Twin Pines Mall scene. Why name it Twin Pines, right? And in that scene, the clock shows 9-11. This brings us to the concept of predictive programming. It's this theory that these hints in media are a way to subconsciously prepare people for big, catastrophic events. The idea is that if people are kind of used to the idea of even subconsciously, they won't freak out as much when it actually happens. It's like these shows and movies were dropping hints, but in the most cryptic, weird, roundabout way. Satoshi Nakamoto. This guy is practically a legend, the mastermind behind Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin, the thing that you decided to gamble your life savings on because you heard it would make you rich, but then boom, it drops by like 50% and you're sitting here watching a YouTube video, crying into your cereal, your Takis or whatever, and your Diet Coke because you have no friends, because they all left you, because you lost all your money on Bitcoin. That's actually a real story. I, I whenever Dogecoin was big, like right before the Elon thing, you know, I put like a bunch of money into it and then I lost <laughs> like all of it. <laughs> Anyways, so Satoshi so Nakamoto, he's up there among the richest on the planet, thanks to his Bitcoin brainchild. But who is this guy? It's like the world's most intriguing game of Where's Waldo. Some folks reckon he's a, like, secret agent type, maybe tied up with the Russian or Chinese government. But then there's this other theory floating around. Some people think he's a Japanese-American dude living in California named Satoshi Nakamoto. This guy's got the smarts to cook up something as complex as Bitcoin, and guess what? He's also not too keen on government oversight, which is pretty much Bitcoin's whole MO. But nah, man, it can't be that, like, straightforward, can it? I mean, you're talking about the father of cryptocurrency here. It's probably something like wild or, like, aliens are involved or something, man, I don't know. All right, guys, that was layer two. Let's get into layer three, which are the known ones. Kate Yup. So there's this YouTuber, Kate Yup, and she's got the internet buzzing. You think mukbangs are just about eating a lot? Nah, this takes it to another level. Kate Yup's channel is like watching something out of a suspense thriller. She's blindfolded, chopping down raw seafood like there's no tomorrow. But it's not just the eating. Her videos have this, I don't know, this sort of ominous undertone. Like in one video, she's got bruises and a lip injury. In another, there's this mysterious voice in the background rushing her to eat faster. It's not your average mukbang weirdness. It's got a darker twist. The internet has been spinning theories faster than a conspiracy theorist's mind. The most popular one is that Kate's being held captive and forced to make these videos. And then she drops a video called I Am Alive and it just fuels the fire even more. In this video, there's something odd about the annotations, like a hidden message. Some of the annotations start with capital letters and if you string them together, they seem to spell out help. That's not just strange, it's straight up alarming. She uploaded a couple more videos after that, but then it was just silence. The last one was in late 2019, and then nothing. It's all kinds of creepy, and it leaves you wondering, is this an elaborate hoax, or is something seriously wrong? I'm holding out hope that it's just a stunt, but man, the mystery of Kate Yup is kind of crazy. The most mysterious song on the internet. So there's this metal song, right? It pops up online, and nobody knows who made it. Seriously, it's like it just fell out of the sky or something. Picture this, a solid track, classic metal vibes, but the artist? A complete ghost. No name, no band, nothing. Just this killer tune floating around the web. The internet, being its usual detective self, goes nuts trying to figure it out. And the song itself has this like haunting, catchy melody that just kind of sticks in your head. Think old school metal, but with a twist of mystery. It's got the kind of tune that would fit right into a Hidden Gems playlist. Theories start flying. Some people say it's like a lost track from an unknown 80s band. Others think it's a recent creation that's made to look old. And then there are those who say maybe it's the work of some metal loving aliens, which is so funny to me. It's like the Among Us of metal songs. It's kind of sus. So wherever the mystery track came from, it's got its own cult following now. It's kind of crazy. Ruth Price. Okay, this one takes us back to the 80s when Ruth dials 911 because there's some creeper snooping around her house. And the call is absolutely bone chilling. Listen to this. Uh, this is uh, Ruth Price of 3877. What's the problem, ma'am? Oh, well, there's some guy been uh, checking the place out. How? Well, he went in the back. I have an apartment in the back, and he said he was looking for a guy. And he comes to my door. And Yes. And, uh, said he's, uh, looking for an apartment. So I'm, I live alone, and I'm an old lady. Mm -hmm. Where is he now, ma'am? I don't have no idea. 
Now the internet thinks that Ruth was murdered by this intruder, all during the call. The source is that there's a video with a title that leaves little to the imagination, called Elderly Woman Murdered During 911 Call. But you know the internet, it loves a good scare. As this call circulates, some law enforcement vets chip in, saying they've heard it in training sessions, like a what not to do kind of thing. But the proof is kind of thin, it's mostly just like a trust me bro kind of thing. Now let's put on our detective hats. Ruth drops a crucial hint in her call, her address, 3877. With a bit of digging and knowing this happened in California, there's this article in the San Diego Tribune, and it says that Ruth gets attacked, but guess what? She fights back, breaks free, and makes a run for it. And Ruth Price, she didn't just make it through that night, she kept on ticking until 1994, passing away at 80. That's resilience. I don't know, man. When I'm in my 60s, the only kind of drama I want is like my 30-year-old goth girlfriend choking me because I keep buying her Starbucks and black clothes. Kanye Quest 3030 Cult. And I'm an example of how Kanye has this like cult-like following, right? Well, Kanye Quest 3030 takes set to a whole new level. This game is an RPG maker gym with no official ties to Kanye himself. Picture this, Kanye is taken out of the trash, gets sucked into a wormhole, and bam, welcome to 3030, where Lil B the base god clone rules the world. The gameplay is kind of like Pokemon, but with rap battles against famous rapper clones. Beat them and they join your crew. It's a hip hop head's dream game loaded with in jokes and cultured nods, but wait, it gets wilder. Two years post release, gamers find this easter egg. Early in the game, you meet this random dude who's like, what do you want to do? And if you talk Type in the word ascend, you turn into a butterfly and get teleported to a secret level. Now here's where things get uh, devious, okay? You enter this level and there's this message that's all, congratulations, you're open-minded, yada yada, but keep this secret, which I am not doing because I'm making a YouTube video about it to my 17,000 subscribers. So you solve some puzzles in this secret level, and if you crack them all, you get this blank screen with a message. They're like, great job, we'll contact you in two weeks for your details. And that's it, game over. But here's where it goes from quirky to kind of creepy. Someone data mined the game, posted their findings online, and guess what? This secret level is an ARG used by a cult named Ascensionism to recruit members. The group's been around since 2006. Monkey hate. The monkey hate ring on YouTube is one of the most bizarre, disturbing internet phenomena I've ever seen. There's this weird subculture of videos featuring baby monkeys in distress or being harmed. And it's not just a few obscure clips, we're talking about loads of playlists and videos. Some made by channels with like huge followings of this kind of content. I don't get it bro. I try so hard on these videos to get views, <laughs> and then these monkey freaking hate videos bro get like millions of views. I guess I gotta start posting that instead guys hit that subscribe button if you want to see uh, a monkey hate videos but here's where it gets even more messed up in the comments if you deep dive into these enough you'll find this like sickness bro people talking about hurting these monkeys in the worst ways imaginable it, it turns my stomach so what's the deal with all this one theory is that it's just twisted humor like those dead baby jokes from the 90s but then there's a darker more sinister theory that i hope isn't true some folks think these videos are a fetish thing where the monkeys are stand-ins for like young humans just saying that out loud is like oh my god bro ah. and the evidence is in the creators names in the content some of these channels have names that give off pretty bad vibes like two letters back to back one of which sounds like the ocean and the other is like taking a piss then there are videos simulating unspeakable acts, like stuff that should be definitely age-restricted. But wait, it gets worse. People are speculating that there are hidden messages in these videos, like passwords or invites to some really weird, shady chat rooms. Whatever it is, it's not something that you'd want to stumble upon. 9738NAMA973. You see, if you squint a bit at that phrase, it actually says the human spelled backwards. Kinda cool, right? I'm talking about a mix of all sorts of stuff. Numerology, which is basically just astrology, but but for numbers. People who are into numerology think that numbers are more than just like counting stuff. They believe these digits have like some secret special sauce or meaning or something. And then there's a bunch of religious stuff that's like all over the place. Bits from the Bible, some Buddhist stuff, and even some Egyptian mythology. It's like a wild mashup of numerology and religion that's kind of interesting but kind of scary and weird. So what's really the deal with 973 et nama 973? Is it an ARG or some kind of cult thing or just the wild musings of some weird math? with like a flair for web design? It's hard to say for sure.
Jeff the Killer original image. So Jeff the Killer is one of those famous creepypastas. If you're watching this iceberg video inside with the lights off, you probably know the story, but just in case there are any Sigma chads watching, I'll explain the story. So the story is with this kid who wakes up in the middle of the night and he like pisses his pants because his door is open. So when he goes up to close it though, he sees a scary guy who just tells him to quote, go to sleep. The creepypasta also has this image with it. <laughs> Sorry, bro. You know I had to do at least one jump scare in here. Okay, but no more, don't worry. So along with this image, there is actually another image of Jeff the Killer that is also floating around. Anyways, this guy attacks the kid with a knife, and the kid is actually able to fight off the weirdo until the neighbors hear, like, what's going on, and they call the police. But then Jeff gets away, and the police can't find him, which, by the way, makes no sense, bro. First, that a kid could fight off a killer. Plus, I mean, bro, this guy is, like, more pale and whiter than the people who use, like, little separators at the grocery store. No shot he could get away without being seen. Anyway, there's another creepypasta that goes along with this. It's like an origin story for Jeff. He was a kid who moved to a new town with his family, and then he started getting bullied by this one group of kids. One one day these kids stole his brother's wallet so Jeff decides to turn on his like kid superpowers that I guess every loser loner kid in this universe has and beats up all the bullies breaking the arm of one of them and then a little while later Jeff's mom makes him go apologize to the bully and bro I promise I'm not joking homie sees Jeff pull up and literally pulls out the gat this is like during a birthday party or something so homie holds the party hostage so that all the bullies can like beat Jeff like the Mexican cartel without any interruptions these kids are like eighth graders from Missouri bro right so at this wild party the bullies go full movie villain mode. They splash alcohol and bleach all over Jeff's face and then whoosh set it on fire. This dude turns into like a budget joker, goes bonkers and starts his own amateur killing spree. He even carves a smile into his face. Seriously, it's like they just mashed up every cliche into this one. It's so stupid bro. Now talk about the infamous Jeff the Killer photo, which let's be real is way creepier than the tryhard story. <laughs> The photo predates the creepypasta, popping up on the web years earlier, and originally it was linked to a YouTuber named Caesar who released the video with the image in 2008. He even had a second, slightly altered Jeff picture. But there's this rumor that the photo was a doctored pic of a girl named Katie Robinson who allegedly posted on 4chan and got trolled hard. The story goes that her photo was morphed into Jeff the Killer, but plot twists has been mostly debunked. By the way, I heard someone mention this like too, but like for real bro, who the hell would ever face reveal on 4chan like for fun. I mean, even if I'm looking fresh, there's no way I'm dropping my selfie on 4chan, bro. So the creator of the Jeff video, Caesar, tries to clear the air, claiming that the photo is him in a latex mask. But guess what? The image actually first showed up on a Japanese message board back in 2005, way before Caesar's video. So the real origin is anybody's guess. In the end, who really knows the truth? And honestly, who cares, bro? Go outside. Like, go to, like, go find a woman or something, bro. Or if you're a woman, go find a man or something, bro. Or, I mean, if you're gay, I mean, you know. Just go out, dude. Stop theorizing over Jeff the Killer bro go do something go keck rock so keck rock is supposed to be this super obscure game from 93 for the sega genesis it's like a ghost man like trying to find legit info about this game online is like trying to find when i lied to my girlfriend like she says i'm gaslighting her but i've never even lied to her so she's going crazy man i don't know anyways the game has been called low effort and unlicensed which basically means that it wasn't exactly hitting the shelves at your local GameStop. it was more like chilling in the local bargain bins at those sketchy discount stores we're talking about the kind of game that your grandma picks up because it's cheap and she thinks that it's like Mario or something. Now there's talk that Kekrock wasn't just a Genesis thing. Rumors say that it was ported to NES and Game Boy, but good luck finding someone who actually owned those versions. It's like saying that you gotta pick a Bigfoot, like everyone's gonna wanna see proof because they just don't believe you. Speaking of proof, there have been some screenshots and pics of the floppy disks versions of those, but let's be real, anyone with like decent Photoshop skills could whip up these. So we're holding our breath on those being legit. The box art is something else, dude. It's got Kekrock and some wild 3D text and there's this janky 3D model of the main dude, Kekarok, is surrounded by these cheesy slogans like rock around the crock and a fun family experience. It's got that vibe of someone trying too hard to be cool, but it's just like cringy. <laughs> so what's the deal with Kekarok? Is it a lost piece of gaming history or just some elaborate internet hoax? The truth is nobody really knows for sure, and that's why it's on the unsolved internet mysteries iceberg. Scrupulous Fingor. Scrupulous Fingor is a classic example of internet creativity running wild. The hoax claims that hidden in the files of the video game New Super Mario Bros. on the Nintendo DS is an unused ghost enemy named Scrupulous Fingor. This character, supposedly shrouded in mystery, was said to be so enigmatic that even Shigeru Miyamoto, the legendary game designer behind Mario, refused to explain its 
origins. Now imagine this, you're a game developer and you've created a character so spooky, so inexplicably weird that you decide, nope, I'm not gonna tell anyone why I made this. It's like if there was some hidden NSFW Among Us art hidden in the Among Us game code. Then, okay, I would take a programming course or two. The hoax likely drew inspiration from a similar internet tall tale, January's Gumbly Hoax. These hoaxes are like the digital world's version of campfire ghost stories, but instead of being told in a dark forest, they're being shared across the glowing screens of social media. In April 2021, Twitter became the breeding ground for this particular piece of digital folklore, with fans jumping on the bandwagon creating fan art and fake screenshots of Fingor. Alright boys, that was Lair 3, let's get into Lair 4 right now. These ones are the subtitle of Kind of Known, so I guess these entries are all kind of known. Emails from Jack Froess. So Jack Froess was this guy from Pennsylvania who sadly passed away unexpectedly in 2011. Things took a super strange turn a few months later when his friends and family started getting emails from his account. And we're not talking about random spam or old scheduled emails, these messages were like seriously personal. Like one of Jack's friends got an email telling him to clean his attic, which sounds kind of normal, right? But here's the creepy part. Jack and his friend had chatted about this just before Jack passed away, so that's not the kind of thing that just anyone would know. Then there's this other email that went to Jack's cousin bringing up a specific ankle injury. Again, super private stuff that's not common knowledge. Everyone's sure that no one else had access to Jack's email, his family and buddies were clear about that, and nobody else knew his password. This rules out the easy guess of someone close to him just sending these spooky emails for fun. It sparked all kinds of theories from someone secretly accessing Jack's account to more out there stuff, like supernatural stuff or some kind of digital afterlife thing. And then just as mysteriously as they started, the emails just stopped. And that was where the story hits a dead end, no one's figured out how these super personal emails were sent from Jack's account after he was gone. It's like a modern ghost story, but with emails instead of a haunting. This one's kind of sad, man. John.com. So John.com is the super intriguing website that's been catching people's attention on the internet for quite a while. It's got this whole mystery vibe going on. Here's the deal with the site. It's super simple, just a bunch of pictures sorted into different categories. At first glance, you're like, okay, cool, just some random pics. But the twist comes when you click on any of these images. Instead of taking you to some like related info or something about the picture, it hits you with a complete curveball. A page asking for an access code. It's like a secret door with a lock and literally no one seems to have the key. The whole enter the secret code thing is really the heart of this mystery. It's got people wondering what's behind these codes. Like, is it for fun, an art project, or some kind of personal website for a specific group of people? Or even scarier, is there more to it? The site doesn't give away any clues and it's been like this for ages, which just adds to the whole enigma. Paranormalana disappearance. So Paranormal Llama, or Alana G, as she was also known, was pretty popular on YouTube. She started around 2014, and, and she was all about like sharing spooky stories and paranormal stuff. Her channel is doing pretty well with over 50,000 subscribers. But here's where it gets weird. Out of the blue, in September 2015, she just disappeared off the internet. Like her YouTube channel is just gone. Social media accounts, poof, vanished. This sudden ghosting, pun intended, of the internet got a lot of people talking and wondering what happened to her. There's this theory that's been floating around and it's kind of concerning. Apparently, one of her last tweets mentioned something about being stalked, which is pretty creepy. So some folks think that she might have ditched her online presence to stay safe from whoever was stalking her. It's like she decided to go full incognito mode for her own safety. But here's the kicker, there's no official word on why she actually disappeared. It's all speculation and guesswork. Her case isn't unique in the YouTube world. Creators sometimes just vanish for various reasons. But the whole stalking angle and how she totally wiped her online existence makes her case stand out as particularly mysterious and a bit eerie. Taylor Swift is a 4chan user. The gist of this is that some people on the internet believe that Taylor Swift, you know, the famous singer, who's also actually a really good singer and people hate her for no reason because they're stupid, might be secretly lurking on 4chan, which is known for being a pretty wild and unfiltered message board. Or as Tony Zaret puts it, I mean, where did you see Bongo? On 4chan? What's that? Offensive meme board for young men? No. So this is from iFunny? This theory seems to have bubbled up from the depths of internet culture, where celebrity theories often take on a life of their own. 4chan is infamous for being a place where pretty much anything goes, and it's been the birthplace of various internet phenomena, memes, and even activist movements like Anonymous. Speaking of Anonymous, they actually started in 4chan around 2003 and are known for their internet activism and hacktivism, often wearing Guy Fox masks in public. They're a decentralized group, meaning there's no real leadership, and they've been involved in a variety of cyber activities. Now, back to Taylor Swift 
in 4chan. This theory doesn't have much in the way of like solid evidence, it's more like a part of the internet's fascination with connecting dots that might not really be connected. But it would be so funny if Taylor Swift was on 4chan, bro. Like imagine if Taylor Swift was in that one, that one chat, that one where it was like the guy was like giving, or he wasn't giving birth, but his wife was like giving birth and he said like, whoever rolls doubles gets to choose <laughs> my kid's name. <laughs> that was a funny time. Sesame Street YouTube hacking. The official YouTube channel for Sesame Street, the beloved children's show, got hacked. Yeah, I know, hacking a kid's show sounds like something out of a bad movie, but it actually happened. The hacker or hackers didn't just mess around a little, they went all out. They made all the legitimate Sesame Street videos private, which means that nobody could watch them. But that wasn't even the worst part. The real kicker is they uploaded a bunch of really inappropriate videos. We're talking about kind of stuff that's not meant for the Sesame Street audience, or any kid for that matter. As you can imagine, this caused a huge uproar. Sesame Street is like a childhood institution, so messing with it is a big deal. The channel got taken down, or terminated in YouTube lingo, because of all these inappropriate uploads. It's like the digital equivalent of someone vandalizing a playground, except way worse. But here's the good news, the story has a happy ending. The channel got brought back, or unterminated, later on. The bad videos were removed, and the legit Sesame Street content was made public again. So everything went back to normal, and the YouTube streets of Sesame Street were safe, once more for kids and adults alike. Never open it, dot rar. The story goes that there's this mysterious file floating around on the internet named neveropenit.rar. The rumor is that this file contains something that can drive people crazy. It's like a digital Pandora's box, promising chaos and confusion for anyone brave or foolish enough to open it. Now, as intriguing as it sounds, there's not a whole lot of concrete info out there about this file. It's mostly shrouded in internet lore and speculation. From what's available online, there isn't a solid confirmation or debunking of what exactly is this file, or like what's in it, or if it even exists in the form that it's described in. It's like one of those urban legends that gets passed around in hushed tones and online forums and chat rooms. Speaking of uh, urban legends, uh, be on the lookout for that iceberg too. There's going to be unsolved internet mysteries, and then the next one's going to be internet hoaxes, and then internet urban legends, and then solved internet mysteries. And then maybe a lost media one as well, because that one gets like crazy views, but I think it's kind of boring. Except no, I don't. I lied. Poi just lied. I don't think it's boring. If I make a video on it, then I'm really into it, and I'm passionate. Anyways, this whole concept of never open it dot rar plays into our deepest fears and curiosities about the unknown corners of the internet. It's a story that has that classic mix of mystery, technology, and the potential for unseen dangers lurking in the depths of the digital world. So while the never open it dot rar file makes for a great tale, it remains one of those unsolved mysteries on the internet, with more questions than answers. Alright, that was layer 4 guys! Let's get into layer 5 called It Is Getting Weirder Down Here. Area 51 Caller. So back on September 11th, 1997, Art Bell, a legendary name in the world of conspiracy theorist talk radio, received a call in his show from a guy who was seriously freaked out. This caller claimed he was a former Area 51 employee. He sounded absolutely terrified and started spilling some wild stuff about extra dimensional beings and secret plots that would change our world in horrific ways. The intensity of his voice and the stuff he was saying had listeners totally glued to their radios. But here's where it gets even weirder. In the middle of this intense call, the show's satellite transmission just cut out, like completely dead. This sudden drop added a whole layer of mystery and conspiracy to the call. People were freaking out, wondering if this was the real deal. Was this guy exposing some top secret Area 51 info and did they cut the broadcast to silence him? Now fast forward to about 7 months later on April 28th, 1998, Art Bell gets another call. This time the caller says, hey, that whole Area 51 thing, yeah, that was a hoax. But here's the twist, the second caller's voice and manner didn't quite match up with the original frantic caller, leading to a bunch of speculation, like some folks think maybe it was a cover up and others believe it really just could have been a really good hoax. And then there are those who think the first call was legit and the second call was someone trying to throw people off the scent. This whole incident became a huge part of Art Bell's legacy in talk radio. It was one of those moments that just captured the imagination of anyone into conspiracies, aliens, and government secrets. The audio from the first call even ended up being used in a song by the progressive metal band Tool, which kind of shows the cultural impact that it had. Paris Catacombs Found Footage So the Paris Catacombs, right? They're this massive network of tunnels under Paris, originally a stone quarry. When Paris ran out of room for the dead in their cemeteries, they moved millions of remains into these catacombs. And now if you go down there, it's like walking through a horror movie scene. Narrow tunnels with walls of bones and skulls. A part of it is open as a museum, but a huge chunk is off limits. That doesn't stop people from exploring though. Here's where it gets spooky. In the 90s, a video was found in the catacombs. It shows a guy, camera in hand, wandering deep inside. Suddenly he starts to panic and run, dropping his camera as he flees into the darkness. The camera keeps rolling until its battery dies. And the big question is, why was he running? Was he lost or was something chasing him? And if he was just lost, I mean, surely he would have went back and got his camera. Like, it was probably pretty expensive, right? He wouldn't just, like, leave it. This footage first popped up 
on a show called The Scariest Places on Earth. They even had film director Francis Friedman go down there to try and figure out what happened to this mystery man. Friedman and his crew searched for hours but found nothing. It's like the guy just vanished. This one's really creepy, bro. The Butcher of 2001. The Butcher, as it was reportedly called, was said to be a film featuring puppets made out of actual human bones. Pretty creepy, right? The story of this film gained traction through a post on Reddit's r slash tip of my tongue subreddit by a user named deaduser00. This user described the film in detail, sparking interest and curiosity among others. Now here's where it gets even more intriguing. The National Film Board of Canada, which was partnered with Viacom at the time, got wind of this and started digging through their archives for any record of The Butcher. But despite their efforts, they came up empty-handed. No evidence of the film's existence was found in their records. This lack of evidence has led to a lot of speculation, like some people think the film might just be a made-up hoax or perhaps a false memory like the Mandela Cattle- Hell bro, no, the Mandela Effect. What is it? Is that what it is, the Mandela Effect? Yeah, I've been watching too much analog horror, bro. There's also a theory that it could be a case of confusion with another movie or show. Like, some have suggested that it might be mixed up with Odo Kuro, or even an episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog. YouTube hacked! The YouTube hacked mystery from Christmas Day 2009 is a fascinating slice of internet history. It's centered around an incident where numerous YouTube thumbnails were changed, supposedly by a user named May Aids. May Aids was known in the YouTube poop community as a notable troll, which by the way, YouTube poops are, are awesome. The intriguing part of the story is the rumored existence of a video called YouTube Hacked, allegedly uploaded by May Aids himself, showing the hacking process. This video, however, has been lost over time and its existence remains unconfirmed. There is a lot of speculation about whether May Aids was actually behind the hack or if it was another user, ADHD Yoshi, who was responsible. What makes this case even more intriguing is that one of the altered thumbnails was of a character named Piano Chan, which was associated with May Aids' profile picture at the time, and this added to the suspicion that it was May Aids who was behind the hack. Despite various discussions and investigations into the matter, including content by YouTuber Implement who briefly mentioned this incident, the true nature of the hack, the identity of the hacker, and the existence of this alleged video remains shrouded in mystery. As of now, the original YouTube hacked video has not resurfaced, and the story has become a part of internet folklore, especially within the YouTube poop community, which is the best community on YouTube, by the way, except for Poi. The, the Poi community on YouTube is better. <laughs> the YTP community is better when you're talking about the Poi, not Poi. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Wrapped.mp3. At its core, this revolves around an audio file that's believed to carry ominous and potentially harmful content. Delving into the depths of this mystery, there are three main theories that have captivated the curiosity of people on the internet. The first theory is quite unsettling and involves a missing child. It suggests that the only clue found in the child's phone was this singular audio file, Wrapped.mp3. This file, according to this theory, contains secret codes, subliminal messages, or elements that could potentially induce suicidal thoughts in listeners. The thought of a lost child's phone harboring such a sinister file adds a layer of horror to the mystery. The second theory shifts the focus from a single incident to a more broad perspective. It postulates that this 13 second clip is a common element in various rap albums used subliminally by multiple artists. The intention, as per this theory, is to manipulate listeners in some undisclosed way. This idea of widespread hidden influence in the music industry adds a conspiratorial angle to the mystery. Lastly, the third theory dives into the realm of the macabre. It suggests that rap.mp3 is not just one, but eight different songs by eight different bands. Each song, according to this theory, narrates the details of murders committed by the members of each band. The chilling aspect of this theory is the belief that the negative energy from these heinous acts is embedded within these songs, potentially affecting those who listen to them. This one's weird, bro. This one, like, on, on the internet just, like, was, like, confusing to research, bro. So I hope I made it, like, as interesting and uh, understandable as possible. <laughs> Interview 2016 Original Audio. Imagine a band known for its raw, aggressive, and often confrontational music. That's Death Grips. Which, by the way, I love Death Grips. And you should follow my Instagram so you can see um, a video I posted of me at a Death Grips concert, which was awesome. And I'm a little white boy, right? So I'm not really used to like heavy shows or anything. I've only been in two concerts in my life. And I went to the Death Grips one and I got a punch to the ground, bro, in the mosh. It was crazy. I'm a little white boy though. I wasn't used to it. it kind of scared me, but it was awesome. Anyways, in March 2016, Death Grips released an EP titled Interview 2016, but it wasn't just about the music. Accompanying this release was a video and this is where things get really fascinating. The video features Death Grips performing live, followed by an interview conducted by Matt Matthew Hoffman. Now, Hoffman is an interesting choice. He represents a more mainstream, polished media persona, which is in stark contrast to Death Grip's unfiltered avant-garde style. This juxtaposition sets the stage for a unique artistic expression. I kind of see the interview as a deliberate artistic statement rather than a straightforward Q&A session. The presence of Matthew Hoffman seemingly out of place in the Death Grip's universe symbolizes mainstream
mainstream media or a generic journalistic figure. His role seems to represent a superficial or external perspective on the band, one that perhaps fails to grasp the depth and nuance of their art. The video's contrast between the band's intense performance and the composed interview segment is striking. It's like a visual metaphor for the disconnect between the artist's true expression and the polished, often superficial representation of them in the media. This theme is further underscored by the lyrics and references in the album, suggesting Death Grip's frustration with how they're portrayed online and in mainstream journalism. Consider the setting of the interview. Hoffman, clean and prepped, sits across from the tired, sweaty band members who've just given their all in a performance. This imagery could symbolize the effort Death Grips puts into their art and how it's often met with a shallow understanding from the outside world. Now think about the camera work. As the video transitions from the performance to the interview, there's a noticeable distortion. This could represent the distortion of the band's message when filtered through the mainstream media. The focus shifts from their music to their personas, and in this process, their true essence of the art risks being lost. Alright guys, that was layer 5, let's get into layer 6, called You Have Been a Scientist, which I don't know, that makes zero sense to me bro, but whatever. Dracula 1920. The mystery of Dracula 1920 is a fascinating piece of cinematic and literary history. It centers around the alleged existence of a Russian film adaptation of Bram Stoker's iconic 1897 novel Dracula. If this film did exist, it would be monumental, claiming the title of the first ever film adaptation of the novel, predating even the famous 1931 version starring Bela Lugosi. However, the existence of the Dracula 1920 is shrouded in uncertainty. The primary challenge in verifying its existence is the complete lack of any physical evidence. No production stills, footage, or credible documentation has been found to confirm the film was ever made or released. This absence of evidence is not entirely unusual for films of that era, especially considering the political and social upheavals in Russia around that time. Like many early films have been lost to history due to various reasons like war or censorship or neglect and the perishable nature of early film materials. The mystery deepens when considering the cultural and historical context. The early 20th century was a turbulent time in Russia, marked by the Russian Revolution and the ensuing changes. If a Russian studio attempted a Dracula adaptation during this period, it could have faced numerous obstacles, including censorship or destruction during the political turmoil. Twelve mysterious and identical stores open on my street, what could be happening? The case of the twelve mysterious and identical stores opening on one street is a curious urban enigma. This mystery, originating from an internet post, claims that a dozen identical stores suddenly appeared on the same street. Such an occurrence is unusual and raises several questions about the nature and purpose of these stores. So this was on Reddit four years ago, and I'm gonna go ahead and read exactly what the original post says, because I feel like if I just try to explain it, it'd be boring. I live just outside a big city in what resembles a suburban main street. Like many suburban main streets, retail business has been rough and they've all closed down. After a month of nothingness, suddenly 12, yes, a dozen identical convenience stores pop up. They look the same, they aim for the same floor plan, they sell the same products at the same prices. The names are all tiny variations off each other, like Town Name Mart or Market of Town Name, and all clearly bought their signs from the same place as the fonts, colors, size, and shapes are identical. These stores see no business that I've ever witnessed and yet have large staff numbers and are surviving way longer than the former stores that close on the street. When I enter one, they all stare at me while I shop. I don't usually get nervous, but it feels like they're staring threateningly, rather than intently. They only accept cash unless you pay some $50. Most of their products are Walmart brand great value products being resold for higher prices. Most of the products are expired food products. I bought bread from them once without checking because I was in a rush, and it turned out it was two months expired. Upon returning to show them, I found that the entire shelf was expired foods. What was even grosser was the dairy cooler which had ancient milk products. I'm so confused, I feel like I'm in an episode of the Twilight Zone. What's possibly happening here? Update. Stayed late at work and didn't end up going yesterday. Sorry for the swarm of people who did remind me with one day. I'm reading through the comments to determine what to do with anything at all. Sorry for a less eventful update, but given how many people were saying I was gonna die, I'm just gonna point out that I'm alive and well. This one's creepy, bro. This one's scary. I remember seeing this like a while ago on the internet. This one scared the hell out of me, bro. I'm still scary. 4chan killer. David Michael Kallick, a 33-year-old man from Washington State, was accused of murdering his live-in girlfriend Amber Lynn Coplin in late 2014. The case took a disturbing turn when it was reported that Kallick posted graphic photos of Coplin's body online. The murder, believed to have occurred late Monday or Tuesday, was followed by Kallick fleeing in Coplin's car. He evaded initial capture by Portland police, engaging in a dangerous pursuit that involved swerving into oncoming traffic. This reckless behavior underscored the desperate and unhinged state he was likely in following the crime. The most horroring aspect of the case was Kallick's decision to share photos of the crime scene on 4chan. The images which matched the real crime scene were accompanied by a message indicating the struggle and reality of committing such an act, starkly contrasting the portrayal of violence in movies. Coplin's body was tragically discovered by her teenage son, who found her in their apartment in Port Orchard, Washington. The scene was marked by chilling details, her driver's license to face with the word dead in phrases like, she killed me first, and bad news 
scrawled in the apartment. These elements painted a picture of a deeply disturbed mindset. Kallik's actions following the murder, particularly his text to a friend, indicated a sense of fatalism and awareness of the inevitable consequences of his actions. His messages implied a finality to the situation, suggesting he knew there was no turning back. Ori Chef The story of Ori Chef is steeped in internet folklore and horror. It's said that she is a Filipino woman who engages in the most heinous of acts, eating children. This tale treads that fine line between urban legend and digital myth. In many cultures, stories of cannibals are often used to scare children into obedience or to convey moral lessons. And it's possible that the story of Ori Chef falls into that category. There's a lack of tangible evidence or credible reports surrounding Ori Chef, which is typical of internet myths. They often thrive in the lack of variability and the ease with which shocking content spreads online. The story could also be an example of how misinformation and sensationalism can lead to the creation of baseless, yet terrifying, urban legends. And then also, to give some more information, I found this one Reddit post right here. Thanks to you slash Auntie Chi for this. I'm gonna read directly from you, bro. I appreciate you. Some people stumbled upon her Facebook page and discovered that she only posted the same handful of photos all the time. They also realized that every friend and linked account was just another version of Ori. Same photos, but photoshopped a bit differently each time. In a couple of the profiles, people say they found posts of gore and her talking about how she wants to eat and kill her children. The creepy red filtered photo was from one of these accounts where there's a story about a girl who wanted to be beautiful, so she had a bunch of surgery done. The surgeries were botched, hence the photo, and the girl commits sewer slide. In actuality, the woman behind all the profiles was contacted and said that she originally made them for Facebook games. And when people discovered her profiles and started talking about how scary it was, she just leaned into it. See, this all comes from this one, like, scary image. <laughs> Right here, it's actually horrifying. This picture is actually horrifying. So I get why this is scary. Oh my god, bro. I'm, I'm Googling it right now. This is actually scary. <laughs> oh, the five hour video. This video seems to be just like a five hour like documentary video on YouTube. And it's gone now. The uh, account that posted it was terminated. But there's still a 12 year old Reddit post that documents like someone finding it and talking about it. It's titled, Want Your Mind Blown? Watch this video. And the last part seems to change in the past few days. It now says USA is a colony of Britain. And a days ago, it said, Prince Willem is the Antichrist. Yeah, so I don't really know what the hell's going on here with this one, <laughs> but it seems to be like a BS five hour conspiracy video or something. Kind of creepy, I guess. 2006 volleyball incident. In 2006, during a high school girls volleyball game, a horrific school shooting allegedly occurred. The details of the shooting are vague and shrouded in mystery. People who claim to know about the incident say it was a gruesome scene with crime scene photos supposedly showing the volleyball net still standing amidst a terrible backdrop. The way some folks talk about it, you'd think it was one of the worst school shootings in US history even worse than the infamous Columbine. But here's where it gets bizarre. There seems to be no official record of this event ever happening. You'd expect something so severe to be all over the news with extensive reports, obituaries, and follow-up stories. Yet, when you try to find any credible information on the internet, there's nothing. No, no news articles, no TV reports. It's like the event never existed. This absence of information has turned the incident into a sort of conspiracy theory or an example of the Mandela Effect, where a group of people remember something that didn't actually happen. In the states near the Dakotas and even in surrounding areas, many people people are convinced the shooting is real. They recall it as a real event and are often surprised or disbelieving when they find out that there's no actual like evidence of it. And it's not every day that somebody just Googles a mass shooting, especially one they believe to be a known fact. Like when was the last time you heard somebody talk about the Columbine and you like Googled it? So most people who have heard about this shooting don't actually bother to verify it online. This one's weird, man. This one's like, what the hell, bro? Hey Kids. At first glance, Hey Kids seems to be like any other YouTube channel aimed at children. It features programs interspersed with clips of children's songs and activities designed to be engaging and interactive for young viewers. The content is described as educational, covering early learning concepts and development milestones, with an emphasis on soothing and calm visuals and music. However, the normalcy ends there. The channel's host is a strikingly odd figure, a mannequin with human eyes and a mouth speaking with an Indian accent. The host's speech is reminiscent of an internet translator, often spewing incomprehensible lines. The videos include nursery rhymes and other typical children's media, but also Finger Family's videos featuring random media characters like SpongeBob Bob and the Smurfs, and then things get even weirder as the channel evolves. The host, dressed as characters like Darth Maul and even Adolf Hitler, start talking about the next generation of humans, referring to human-looking AI. The content becomes increasingly random and nonsensical until YouTube apparently shuts it down for spam. The mystery deepens with the revelation that one of the producers listed as DeepMind Technologies, a British AI company acquired by Google. This connection hints at the possibility of Hey Kids being a part of a larger AI experiment. The theories about Hey Kids are as varied as they are disturbing, like one possibility is that this was indeed a massive AI testing 
experiment with Hey Kids as a central piece. The alternative and darker theory is that a psychopath might be running the channel, using actors like Samantha and the twins for his bizarre videos. Hey Kids also maintains a presence on Twitter and Facebook, indicating ongoing activity despite the YouTube shutdown. This aspect adds another layer of mystery, like is the channel still part of an experiment or is there something more sinister at play? Alright guys, that was the Unsolved Internet Mysteries Iceberg, I hope you guys enjoyed. Again, be on the lookout for all the other internet blank iceberg videos coming out. Please subscribe so you can see the next one, because if you watch this long, it means you kind of enjoyed it, I guess. Yeah, Jesus loves you, God died for you, and uh, yeah. Everybody have a great night. Sweet dreams.